But uh, anyway, with no further ado, Avon Hudson. <laughs> Well, I don't want to dwell too long because it might get boring, but uh, I doubt that anyone much. that wants to uh, tell me to be quiet in about a half an hour or whatever. Um, well, my role in all this uh, was a bitter one to this day. And uh, I'd start by saying that we're nearly at the right place to have this talk. Nearly. We, we could have probably had it at uh, Roxby. To just put you in the picture, because Roxby, uranium mine, is where nuclear weapons start. It's the mining of uranium. And then it finally gets processed put into power stations, they take it out a year or so later and uh, take the plutonium and other stuff out of the fuel rods, process it into plutonium 239 and that's the fuel for the nuclear weapon. So if you've got a power station you can get six or eight or ten bombs depending on the size of the power station every year. But it doesn't finish there and then the reprocessing you're left with a mountain of waste. What do you do with the waste? Well, we don't know yet because there's no safe method of disposing of it. So now we know all that, you can see why we wouldn't want uranium mined anywhere because that just leads to new nuclear weapons. And if no more nuclear weapons, like America's got, what, 10,000 or something, uh, uh, they'll build new generation nuclear weapons which are very much more efficient than the weapons they got. That of word efficiency. It's hard to believe that scientists would work to make it more efficient to kill people and destroy whatever, wherever. And um, that's just a little insight into the nuclear fuel cycle where it goes and how it starts. But my role in it was, uh, I was in the Air Force, and uh, the world is a different place nowadays, 50 odd years later. And in those days, <coughs> you've done what you were told. You rarely questioned what was happening, because if you dared <coughs> to question it, you were insubordinate weren't allowed to do that sort of thing uh, and it led to trouble for you. So we got sent to Maralinga. In my case I got about five days warning. I was sent down from Darwin. I was at Laverton in Victoria, the air base just out of Melbourne and for the first time for a while I was quite happy in the Air Force. I got back to where I wanted to be, not at Melbourne, but back on an air base where I'd been, where I'd be directly engaged with aeroplanes, because that was my life. I lived for aircraft. There was nothing really much mattered other than aeroplanes in the real world. Work. So I was working in air movement section, and that was very nice. And I was, had access to Melbourne which was a nice city. I liked Melbourne. And then one morning, uh, two black-suited gentlemen turned up at the uh, air movement section and I was summoned in and the door was slammed behind and I was sat down and lectured and asked uh, about <coughs> 500 questions over the next hour dating right back to my grandmother and grandfather and Christ knows what other else they wanted to know. And I didn't know what it was about, so I dared to ask a question. What was this all about? And the ASIO officer, who was taking all this information and filling out reams of notes, 
that's what he came over the desk at me and he said you don't ask questions he said you're here to answer them so I never got an explanation why I was there or anything but anyhow that was all after a while they said that's it and four days later I was on a plane going to Maralinga and that was that so I when I got that uh, news I knew quite a number of chaps that had been to Maralinga uh, several years earlier and this was in 1960 now the major test took place in 1956 Operation Buffalo and 1957 Operation Antler seven nuclear weapons were fired off in those two years and they were big weapons some of them very big like uh, the 27 kiloton weapon was supposed to have been the biggest at Taranaki but it turns out that even that weapon at 27 kilotons was very much es underestimated. It was something like 40 kilotons. And these last weapons that were fired in that period were leading up to the thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs. They were the test weapons for hydrogen weapons that was tested at Christmas Island in the Pacific, not that Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean. There was two Christmas Islands back in that time. Now that one in the Pacific is not called Christmas Island. It's what's the name? Kiribati or some name. Anyhow, the Maldon Islands. If you look on the map, Maldon Islands, that's where it all happened. And they tested the, the thermonuclear weapons there after they had the biggest bomb uh, exploded at Montebello in 1956 also. It was about 90 odd kilotons, and it was only supposed to be about 30. And the Hiroshima was about 60, wasn't it? Uh, no, 20. 20. There you go. Yeah, it was a very, very big bomb. They, they were it was huge by comparison. It would have wiped a city like Adelaide off. So if they dropped it in the middle of Adelaide, it would have wiped it right out to uh, Jepps Cross and right down to, say, Shepherd's Hill Road and right out to Port Adelaide and right. In other words, Adelaide would vanish. It was a very big bomb. So, that all happened there, and I knew all these chaps that had been there, and I lived and worked with them, and they said, oh, you don't worry about it. She's right, all the bloody blo the testing's over. You know, she's a, she's a bit of a bludge up there. Now you're just, just carrying maintenance, and you'll have nothing to do anyhow. Well, it couldn't have been further from the truth. When I arrived there, there was a thousand people there. British scientists all running around like lunatics, which they were, most of them. <laughs> there was very few of them. That were not even mildly sane, they were very acutely insane, I often thought. But however, that was only my opinion. Uh, so, I uh, was there about a uh, fortnight, a bit over, and I was given familiarisation with the layout of the place and I went out back and forth to the range a number of times and visited a number of sites so that I knew where everything was. I didn't do a lot in the first couple of weeks other than drive around a lot. Drove about a thousand miles in that time and um, then uh, one morning I was summoned to the officer's uh, <coughs> quarters and um, shown into the headquarters of Maralinga where the range commander was and I was told that I had to go and see a chap by the name of Taylor. Well I didn't know Taylor from Adam. <laughs> <laughs> 